So now I'd like to formally welcome you to this third Thirsty Food for Thought program. My name is Bill Gillespie. I'm a board member at Old Pueblo Archaeology Center here in Tucson, Arizona, another nonprofit organization is bringing you this presentation. And for tonight's third Thursday program, Old Pueblo is delighted to welcome our guest presenter, archaeologist Matthew Pales, PhD. Dr. Pales received his BA in anthropology from the University of Oklahoma in 2005 and his master's and PhD from the University of Arizona in 2008 and 15, respectively. Since 2016, he's been assistant or associate professor, now associate, at the University of Oklahoma. Matt has worked in a variety of locations, including the Southwest, the Southeast, the Plains of the US, as well as overseas in Morocco. His principal research has been in Northwest Mexico, where he's focused on the political economy of the 12th through the 16th centuries. For the past six years, Matt has collaborated with colleagues John Carpenter and Guadalupe Sanchez, two other U of A connected folks, investigating the variable histories of the different valleys throughout Sierra's Sierra Madre, Madre Occidental. Mexico Northwest has often been viewed as, a, as terra incognita in the grand scheme of North American history. Various archeologists, historians, popular writers have viewed Northwest Mexico as the origin point for major social movements or as the source or destination of populations that developed in the US Southwest or as a cultural transition area from Mesoamerica to the US Southwest. In his presentation this evening, Dr. Pales will review recent research in Northwest Mexico, focusing primarily on the Sierra Madre Occidental, and we'll discuss how we might begin to place this Tierra Incognita in its rightful place in continental scale narratives. So please welcome this month's third Thursday Food for Thought guest speaker, Dr. Matt Pales. Thank you. Let me just get things open and shared here. Um, here we go. Maybe. There we go. So thank you very much uh, for this introduction. So just to provide a little bit of context here, um, only a slight derivation from that intro I wrote a month or so ago. Um, you know, Al's uh, instigation for this was in reference to an article in a, a book that I wrote with Michael Searcy, um, where we talk about the overall history of Northwest Mexico. And he asked if there were a couple of themes or vignettes that I could pull from this, um, particularly to highlight how Northwest Mexico um, interacted and is related to uh, the Southwest US, which is a region I imagine most people have heard quite a bit about in these lectures. So with that in mind, we're going to go a little bit beyond uh, the Sierra Madre Occidental. Northwest Mexico is obviously a quite big region. Um, so we're not going to try and cover the entire region. We'll stick to that region along the modern day um, border. So we're going to cover Trincheras, Rio Sonora, uh, Serena as kind of an amalgamated Sierra Madre Occidental region and a bit on Casas Grandes as well. Um, I should uh, emphasize from the get-go here that Sierra Madre Occidental is a region that I'm really a, a specialist in. So I'm very much gonna be drawing on the work of others when I discuss Trincheras and Casas Grandes where I've done a tiny bit of work, but in the grand scheme of things, I'm very much an armchair archeologist myself. So hopefully I do their views justice, but I'll always try to point out whenever I'm deviating from their um, existing narratives. So this overall question of how Northwest Mexico is related to the U.S. Southwest is an enduring question in Southwest archaeology, and it works its way even to our lexicon. We're always kind of fumbling about for a way to describe this region, both as its own unique location, but also in a kind of more inclusive sense of what word we could use to reference both of these regions at once. But going back to the initial luminaries of Southwest archaeology, it was generally accepted that there was no real important distinction that existed along the modern day international border. Um, if you look back at things like the North American Handbook, you can see their definition of the Southwest. It's almost half in uh, Northern Mexico. My own personal favorite definition for what constitutes the Southwest is um, Las Vegas to Las Vegas and Durango to Durango, which again, it's you know, more than half of the Southwest down in Mexico. Or you can even talk about folks like um, Charles de Peso, who drew an even larger um, square for what he thought was relevant to understanding processes that occurred in what today we think of as the U.S. Southwest. 
Um, throughout this lecture, I'll try to tack back and forth between specifying Northwest Mexico and a, a kind of a broader sphere of interaction that we refer to as the North American Southwest. Right. So to just kind of, again, contextualize why we think this is important, you know, those early days of Southwest archaeology, a lot of the similarities that were argued to kind of under, you know, gird this kind of grand you know, definition of what constituted the Southwest and North American Southwest. It was mostly the mundane things, you know, three porta grooves, axe, brownware, ceramics, those sorts of things. But it's also something that gets invoked, as mentioned in the introduction there, in, in many of these kind of more flashy stories of ideas of instigation for big social movements or big political um, theaters. So to just kind of fit this in a metaphorical sense, I started a presentation out a couple of years ago at the Southwest Symposium with this metaphor of thinking about how do you classify diversity and variability in, in a kind of grander sense, right? And so archaeology is often borrowed from biology in this sense, not necessarily in a great way, but I'll kind of play with this metaphor a bit myself. And if we think about basic taxonomy, there's something called a ring species, right? And this particular cases famous in Linnaean taxonomy, that if you go up in Northern Europe, there are two species of what are obviously different goals, one very light colored, one very dark colored. If you look to the west, you see the light colored. If you look to the east, you see the dark colored. But it turns out if you kind of move around the globe where people did not originally do Linnaean taxonomy and it took us a couple of decades to sort this out, you get a kind of gradual shift in the color of goals as you move around the globe. And it's only if you happen to be standing basically in Scotland that you mistake these for being two distinct species because they don't really interact with each other, they don't interbreed, they look like very different species, right? But this is really just a matter of perception. And I would argue that much of our perception and what we think of the U.S. Southwest it is metaphorically a very similar scenario where if you stand in Flagstaff, Arizona, and instead of looking east and west, you look north and south, you see a lot of difference, right? Hoacom looks very different from ancestral Puebloan. But if you complete the loop, Right. If you follow Hoacom down the west coast of Sonora there, right, you see a gradual transition in a lot of basic traits. You know, red and brown pottery slowly gives rise to something that's a lot more diverse, right? Um, rancheria style settlement patterns start to give way to something that looks more Pueblo-esque, right? If you go the other way, up through the ancestral Puebloan region and through the Mugion and down through Casas Grandes, you get the same thing in the other direction, right? So basically, the argument here is that by only looking at half of the Southwest at any one point in time, we're really missing a huge part of the story that these things that may in fact look very different could in fact all be quite closely related. And then of course, we also know that there's just ancient history that ties these regions together. Um, two very obvious examples are one, just the distribution of the sorts of resources that people relied upon, particularly the crops, maize. We know that came from Mesoamerica. It had to at some point in time move up through Northwest Mexico to get to the US Southwest. And how exactly this happened is a story that's much more ancient than the regions and the times we'll be focusing on today. But there must have been some sort of continuums and way for information to move through these regions for a very long time period. And we can also look at the historic and modern distribution of indigenous languages. And we see that there's obviously a lot of shared ancestry there as well, particularly with the Udo Aztecan language family. Um, and this is most closely seen with groups such as the Autum, which have very close linguistic relatives throughout much of Sonora, and then strangely enough, even further down here on the very kind of frontier, of what we think of as Mesoamerica. So we know there's an ancestry there. The question is, can we actually see it? But again, that's kind of a more ancient time period than what we'll be focusing on today. So I'm gonna run through these three regions. We'll start with Casas Grandes, and I should stress that I'm not gonna be telling the whole story of Casas Grandes here. This is gonna be a very cherry picked presentation. And I know Al has got um, Paul Minnis on tap to do a presentation here in a few months. So I'm also going to try and avoid what I imagine might be his um, main themes. And so uh, apologies to Paul if he's out there listening that I'm going to largely exclude him, but it's so that he can present it um, as fresh information himself when he does this in a couple of months. So I imagine a lot of folks have probably heard a lot about Casas Grandes. Um, there was just discussion uh, before we uh, joined the rest of the group that there's going to be some tours down there in the near future. So I'm going to try and run through the basic um, history of the region pretty quickly here. I promise not to move this quickly through the majority of the presentation, but since a lot of folks have probably heard this part before, it'll fly by pretty quickly here. So the emerging chronology that folks have started to agree on here 
very different than what Charles de Peso first suggested back in the 1970s. Um, we believe the medial period probably starts at around 1150 or so. Some folks would still tack this at around 1200, but then there is an observable transition at around 1300. And we think it's in this post 1300 period that the big large city, the real urban center of the region known as Pakime, that it corresponds to this later period that goes from about 1300 to 1425 or so. And again, there's kind of recent movement on this. Some folks would still take it to, to closer to 1450. There's definitely kind of squishiness in some of these interpretations. And so I'm going to run through real fast a description of why Pakime is so impressive. And then we'll kind of come back to some of these themes about how interpretations of Pakime really tie into larger narratives of what's going on in the larger North American Southwest. So Pakime is exceptional in large part for not only the very special things that are found there, which I'll also review in just a moment, but also just a sheer amount of labor that was used to build the center. And oftentimes that labor was very conspicuously above what was necessary for just a purely functional um, you know, st structure building. And again, these are ideas that are pointed out both by De Peso, but also more recently by Wayland and Minnis. And so we have very thick walls. I was just down there recently at a conference and um, Steve LeBlanc was down there and measuring walls. And some of the thickest ones are up to a meter 30 thick. Now those are probably supporting some upper rooms, but nonetheless, most of the rooms, they're probably only one or two stories, right? They still have these very thick walls. It takes a lot of labor to build adobe that thick. And presumably this is kind of showing off in some extent that it's a form of conspicuous conception. And we can see this not only just in the thickness of the walls, but also the number of walls used for some rooms. So famously, we have these butterfly rooms that have upwards of 17 walls. There are also cross-shaped rooms. There's undoubtedly some iconography significance here, but really it's probably mostly just about kind of showing off the labor and the amount of control that people have to build something so elaborate um, and so time consuming. I mentioned there's a, a debate about how tall Pakime was. Um, you'll see estimates out there that it was up upwards of seven floors. That's probably not very accurate. A much more reasonable estimate is probably three or four floors in just a couple of places with the vast majority of the city being one and in some places, two floors. There are also unique features such as colonnades, colonnades being a, a row of columns, not something that you see a whole lot of in North America. At Pekime, we have them both in adobe form and also in wooden post form. The only other place these really show up in uh, any sort of regular form is up in Chaco Canyon. So here's a picture from Chetro Kettle, right? Where you can see the stubs of a colonnade, right? So a really kind of unique building tradition. To De Peso, this was signs that there must have been Mesoamerican influence at Pekime. Um, famously, he interpreted this as being an inspiration from Tula. The dates don't really match up for that, but you do certainly get colonnades down in Mesoamerica as well. We also have a lot of elaborate public architecture. So there are, in most people's interpretation, three ball courts. Two of them are this um, I-shaped form that is very much associated with Mesoamerica. I imagine you've probably had many presentations on the Hoacom, so you probably all know there's ball courts in many other parts of the North American Southwest as well, going from the Hoacom region up into the Sinagua. Those are a different form, but nonetheless, there is a commonality in the use of the ball game in these kind of political theaters, presumably. There's also a number of effigy mounds and regular platform mounds. We can see this large square platform mount associated with this nice I-shaped ball court. There's also a mound of the cross, which has a number of celestial orientations that are probably quite important. Um, I mentioned a couple of effigy mounds, one that's kind of uncontroversially a serpent, quite likely a, a feathered serpent referencing Mesoamerican deities. Um, there is another one that uh, De Peso interpreted, excuse me, interpreted as being the head of a decapitated macaw. That one takes a considerable more amount of kind of squinting and imagination to see, but it is certainly an unusual form. And then in addition to this, the basic architecture, there are many, many impressive things that wound up at Pakime. When I teach this as an undergraduate class, you know, I basically describe this as if people could find anything interesting on the landscape, they picked it up and they took it to Pakime. Pakime had this incredible gravity to kind of pull in all of these amazing things. And one of my favorite stories is that they actually brought in a 2,300 kilogram meteorite, which is now in the Smithsonian Museum. They cut it in half for some reason to, to get a better look at it, but it did not look like this when it was found at Pekki Maine. 
but also many exceptional things in the form of copper, macaws and turkeys, rare minerals. We have some photos of a couple of these, and this is where I'll really kind of fly through these things. Um, a lot of these things are quite um, significantly concentrated in only a few rooms. Um, there was one room with over 700 pieces of copper in it. Um, interestingly enough, there's not actually a whole lot of this uh, stuff in, in burials. There is some, but not a whole lot. Most of it is in these kind of storeroom sorts of context. Um, in the case of copper, the peso thought it was being made locally. Almost everybody agrees since then that it was probably actually being imported from West Mexico. You find copper bells in low frequency kind of across the North American Southwest and other parts of Northwest Mexico as well. But Pacume is really kind of the singular place where you see a very large amount of it. There's also a decent bit of Chaco Canyon, I should mention. There are over 4 million pieces of shell um, at Pacume, but worth pointing out that 3 million of those pieces are these very small Nisarius beads, or Nisarius, excuse me. Um, if you go to the Pacume Museum, which I recommend to everybody, it's one of only two archaeological um, monuments in Northwest Mexico, Pacume is one, Trincheras is the other, we'll also talk about Trincheras. But they have this nice display where they show you a, a whole lot of these Nisarius beads, but um, they're kind of cheating. If you look closely, there's actually a, a styrofoam core that takes up the vast majority of this volume. You can kind of see the edge of it poking up there. But nonetheless, 3 million pieces of shell. Pacume is not exactly what you would call close to any ocean. Um, a very impressive effort to haul all of this over the Sierra Madre and then to put it in a number of isolated storerooms. There's a lot of debate about what this means. You can interpret this in a number of ways. The peso interpreted it as being um, basically stored for imminent dispersal. He saw this very much as kind of a mercantile center. Um, more recently, it's been interpreted as a store of community riches. You can think of something as being sort of analogous to, to Fort Knox. The gold that's there is kind of, in a certain sense, belongs to all Americans. You can't necessarily just go up and knock on the door and take any out, right? But nonetheless, it kind of provides us all with a certain level of prestige that we hold this as kind of like a national wealth, right? Maybe this was kind of something similar for Pequimeños. And then lastly, there's the, the straightforward interpretation that maybe it was just some very wealthy individual's personal riches, right? And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about some of these interpretations. Okay, so why so many exotic goods? Um, as I've mentioned a couple of times, uh, the original excavator, Charles de Peso, along with his Mexican colleagues, they interpreted Pequime as being very much a mercantile and manufacturing center. I'm not gonna put too much emphasis on that interpretation because it really hasn't stood up to the test of time. And the short version of why is that you just don't see much evidence for any of this stuff leaving Pequime. Um, Paul Menes and Mike Whalen have done a lot of work in the surrounding region and they just don't really find much of it anywhere. And, except at Pequime. And so that also undermines this kind of second uh, interpretation here that maybe was for tribute or redistribution. This is you know, also an economic model, but with just a slightly different spin on the organization, but nonetheless should look the same archeologically where you should see a lot of this stuff flowing out of Pequime. And again, we just don't see much evidence for it. So where I'm really gonna pay a synthesis is on these last two interpretations um, that very much kind of center on the ideological sphere. So one of these, and it's become quite well known, um, is not what I would call necessarily a consensus uh, um, opinion that this is what happened, but it has in fact uh, gained a number of um, vocal supporters it, that accept it to you know, varying levels with their own modifications. It's the idea of the Chaco Meridian, and this was developed by um, Steve Lexen at the University of Colorado, and he points out that the chronology, and this is even more true as we've started to tinker a little bit and move things around by a couple of decades, that the chronology of Pacume more or less lines up with what we know is going on in the very northern southwest, which large depopulations. Right? So first we have Chaco Canyon going strong for several hundred years, a very impressive political ritual center that seems to kind of start to fall apart at around 1140, 1150. I'm not a Pueblo and archaeologist. Somebody else might want to correct me on some of these dates. Right. Then we see a movement of many of the elites and presumably many of the common people as well to Aztec ruins, just a little bit north of that. And that goes until the very late 1100s to around 1200 or so. And then we go straight south to Pacume in around 1200. But maybe that's not quite a perfect alignment, but you know it gets us at least in the range of when we think that Pacume really kind of took off. If you recall, the latest interpretation of Pacume is that it really doesn't start to take off until about 1300 or so, but there's definitely 
differences of opinion about exactly when that date is, but we get in the ballpark. Right? And so the basic idea of Lexin was that you don't necessarily have a ton of people moving between these centers, but you have an elite class of people who kind of carry the ritual and political knowledge of how to run a very fancy political place moving around the Southwest. And there is something symbolically significant about staying on this North-South meridian, this alignment, not only with these different centers, but also with the North Star. Right? And there are some decent lines of evidence. There are certainly things that are shared commonly between Chaco Canyon and Pecky May. I already mentioned the colonnades, um, but you also get a lot of T-shaped doorways. Here we have what's referred to as an altarpiece, this T-shaped form. Again, obviously a, a significant form in Pecky May. Um, Steve LeBlanc, a different Steve, um, has also emphasized that there's a number of other material goods that are very much associated with elite identities that seem to appear in Chaco Canyon before they appear in Pecky May. So like I said, there are um, you know, a, a number of scholars. This is not all just Steve Lexen who supports this idea of clear links between Chaco Canyon and Pecky May, even if they don't all necessarily buy the meridian um, significance of the north-south alignment. Right? Another interpretation is that by Michael Mathewitz. Um, and he also notes that there is definitely strong iconographic elements that are shared widely, but instead of looking north, he looks to the south or really to the southwest. And this in large part is a kind of revamping of the peso's original interpretations. The peso got the dates kind of all wrong for Paki May. So his original interpretations of it being kind of a, a refuge or connected to places like Tula just don't really make sense. Those places were already gone by the time that Paki May really took off. But instead, he argues that we see a lot of close connections with West Mexico, and particularly the region that we refer to as Aztecland. So we're talking Southern Sinaloa and Nayarit, that particular area. And there are definitely some very strong material connections between that region, um, ritual activity connections, things like long bone burials and urns and things that are a little bit too specific to be coincidental. Right? And then I would uh, definitely be doing this part of the lecture a disservice if I didn't mention that Wayland and Menace have a very different model. Like I said, I'm not really going to put emphasis on this because I think you'll probably get a, a very nuanced kind of presentation of this in a few months by Paul Menace. Um, but they have a different spin on things. And they certainly don't deny that, you know, Pakimo is connected to these other places, but they see it as a fundamentally local story. Um, and a lot of this is, is predicated on trying to explain something that they don't think really needs it to be explained, right? So both Lexin and to a lesser extent Matthewitz, they really see um, a sharp distinction between what came before and then what came with Packy May. And they argue that for the most part, we've just really missed that there were in fact a lot of people that were in this valley in an earlier time period and that you can in fact kind of account for everything with a mostly local sequence. But again, well, we won't dwell on that interpretation too much. So, what I am going to talk a little bit more about are these kind of ideological interpretations, right? So the peso was very much an economics model. Weyland and Minnis also an economics model of a certain sense, but much more focused on kind of subsistence management as opposed to rare goods management like the peso had. Right? But now the pendulum has really kind of swung more towards these ideological explanations for how you control a populace out of a center like Paki May, where it appears that everything is flowing in as opposed to much of anything flowing out. And there's two different spins on this. So one of them is the model by the Van Pools, which argues that Paki May was run by a group of shamans. And specifically, they use the term shamans because they're playing on a lexicon that is common across anthropology for a group of ritual specialists that undertake communication with the supernatural on behalf of people and use this to a certain extent to leverage their own position in society, right? So if we think about a distinction of a shaman relative to a priest, right? A priest will typically tell you how you're supposed to go about talking to the supernatural yourself. They may also do it on your behalf, but largely they're there to guide you on your own kind of spiritual journey with the supernatural, where a shaman has a real special relationship that not everybody in that society has the potential to hold. And they are the only ones who can get you certain sorts of actions out of whatever form of the supernatural that you believe in. And they point out the iconography of Pakime has a lot of things that kind of fit with a shamanistic interpretation. And so here is one set of images uh, pulled from a set of polychrome um, ceramics. And what they argue is going on here is that one, we have a shaman that's in a sort of dream state and you can see this bird kind of riding along. Well, this is something that's very common if not universal to kind of shamanistic traditions that you often have a spirit guide of sorts that comes along with you. And you might also notice that they seem to be turning in 
to the spirit guide to a certain sense, right? So we refer to this as theranthropy. There's other important iconograph iconographic, excuse me, symbols going on here. For example, this mesh grid up here is known from the larger North American Southwest to, to probably be a maize field and maybe these little pound signs here as well represent to some extent a, a concept of fertility tied to, to that maize field. That's not all the Van Poole's ideas, but other folks have pointed that out as well. So um, again, to kind of emphasize this therianthropy idea, you know, it's more or less similar to werewolves, but with a much more positive connotation, right? That this idea that you have to become a certain sort of supernatural being to go and commune with the supernatural. Um, again, drawing on the global literature of shamanism, oftentimes this is done in the context of taking psychoactive substances. And, you know, they would also point out certain ceramic images such as this one here, where again, we can see many different iconographic elements. These are probably feathered serpents, Quetzalcoatl um, references. Again, presumably a shaman, you can see those pound signs, which they take to be a sign of a shaman identity. And again, they're going through this theranthropic transformation, but in an overall context that certainly looks like it maybe has some sort of mind altering substance involved in the interpretation. This doesn't necessarily have to be super powerful psychoactive um, agents, just smoking a lot of tobacco can in fact produce these sorts of states. And they argue that that is probably the most likely scenario for how this was achieved. And in fact, we do have a couple of these effigy vessels that seem to be showing important people imbibing a certain amount of some sort of smoke substance here, quite likely tobacco, right? So that is one set of interpretations. Um, in my own views, I uh, find a little bit more convincing the arguments by Matthew Witz, who looks at the same set of iconography and points out that there is a much more kind of direct um, source of inspiration for interpreting these, which is that we can just go to Mesoamerica. And certainly these arguments to some extent could be called cherry picked and that they kind of take iconography from many different parts of Mesoamerica to build up these arguments. But much of this is certainly present in West Mexico where they think there was probably very direct interaction. And here we see some costumed individuals specifically donning a costume that is associated with the Mesoamerican deity of Xochipilli. And you can see they certainly look like they're wearing a sort of birdman or perhaps even a specifically macaw sort of costume. And that you can imagine that this might just be how this is depicted on these ceramic vessels, right? So again, these images up here are from Mesoamerican codices, whereas these down here are from uh, Pakime ceramics. And there is a you know, a fair case to be made that the iconography is related to the same actual ritual traditions. And so um, a potential path that Matthew Woods maps out is that ultimately these traditions probably started in the basin of Mexico, but then specifically they go through West Mexico in this tradition that we refer to as Aztec and then presumably through Pakime. And then a lot of these traditions show up again in altered form in the historic Rio Grande Pueblos and some of the other Pueblos as well. And Matthewitz even goes so far as to, to name the deities. So it starts out as Oshlipili. Um, you know, my Nahuatl is not great, so I don't know if I should try to pronounce this, but something like Pilzintli is what this is referred to in um, West Mexico. We wouldn't know the name of this deity as it existed in Paquime, but among the Pueblos, there are many different iterations um, not only the Rio Grande, but uh, Matthew Woods makes connections to Zuni and other places as well, where they seem to have a deity that in some way carries over some of the associations that we see going all the way back to Xochipilli. Right? So this, again, is perhaps a potential leak between the religious traditions of Northwest Mexico going to Mesoamerica, coming through Northwest Mexico as kind of a gateway to the Southwest. Now, I will say there's an alternative interpretation to this which is if you're familiar with the historic period at all, then Coronado's expedition, as well as a few after that, they brought with them not just a band of scrappy conquistadors, but also several thousand Mesoamerican natives. And so this is another potential source for when some of these traditions may have been introduced to the Pueblos, not as a really an ancient tradition, but as something that was much more recent. And there's you know, currently a debate over exactly when these traditions got established there. So just to wrap up the Pakime section here, um, mainly because it's going to play into some of the other themes I talk about here in a moment. Uh, there's a lot of debate about what happened at the end of Pakime. De Peso um, interpreted as being sacked by invaders. Some other people have suggested maybe it was more of an internal peasant revolt of sorts. Um, Weyland and Minas really prefer a kind of slow decline model, which seems to, to make sense with a lot of more recent data. 
Um, some people have suggested maybe we're close enough in time that we just got the dates a little off and it's actually European disease. This seems increasingly unlikely. But there's, whoops, there are certainly some bodies at Pecume that don't conform to a normal burial pattern. And you can explain some of these away as maybe being misinterpreted, but there are clearly some such as those that are strewn across doorways where it's very obvious that something bad happened at Pacume and maybe it was already mostly depopulated at this point, but there was some sort of catastrophic end that did occur at Pacume, even if it was only a handful of people left at that point. So we really don't know what happened is the short answer uh, to the end of Pacume. I have a graduate student who hopes to at least contribute to this discussion in the near future. Okay, so now we're going to transition into Sonora. And like I said, we're only going to focus on two traditions here, Chincheras and then an amalgamated is here, Madre Oxen and Tal, that'll link the real Sonora and Saranam. And so first we're going to go over to Chincheras, another region in which I am very much an outsider presenting the views of other illustrious scholars, particularly in this case, Randy McGuire and Alyssa Villapondo, who have done decades of research in this wider region. Um, this is the other location where there is an official archaeological monument in Northwest Mexico that I would heavily encourage you to visit the Cerro de Chincheras. I should mention the terminology in this region can be a little confusing. It's referred to as the Chincheras region. The largest site in the region is the Cerro de Chincheras, but then there's also a type of sites known as Cerro de Chincheras. I'll try to slow down when we get to those points to make those distinctions clear. So Chincheras uh, is often been interpreted by outsiders, and there's a number uh, of different models that Randy McGuire and Alyssa Villapondo like to kind of hold up as the kind of basic starting ground for how Trincheras has been understood in the past. Um, there are a lot of very clear, um, at least superficial, perhaps deeper similarities with the Hoakam region. And so this gave rise to a lot of interpretations that Trincheras was just a rustic version of the Hoakam. Right? Um, other folks looking from the outside in, I've tried to kind of use Trincheras as a bit of a black box to, to fill in gaps in, in larger narratives. So it's often been interpreted as either a Hohokam or a Mesoamerican or a Casas Grandis kind of center of shell acquisition and exchange to explain patterns that are actually kind of based outside of Trincheras region. And then another interpretation, and this is the one that's kind of most preferred by Alyssa and Randy, that they are a distinctly local group that perhaps has a very ancient shared ancestry with Hohokam, but that in a lot of ways has a kind of more broadly shared ancestry with much of the North American Southwest and the Hohokam links are not necessarily this, even the strongest. Okay. So again, to kind of emphasize this Hohokam discussion, um, uh, to my mind, there are certainly uh, what I would think of as perhaps superficial, but perhaps more profound links that are evident in basic material culture. So here we just have a comparison between basic ceramics. Um, Hunter Claypatch has done an amazing dissertation looking at, at kind of the fine grain details of these. And he would actually argue that there's a kind of more deeper significance in, in connections with the Mogollon region and the Hohokam. But certainly, at least in the painted traditions, you can see that there's a very obvious superficial um, similarity. So here we have some colonial air ceramics on the left from the Hohokam region and then the Chincheris on the right. They both have this kind of wallpaper style of these very small elements. Same story with shell jewelry. They both used a lot of shell jewelry. You find shell bracelets in both regions that look the same. But importantly, whether you're talking about ceramics or you shell, if you look at how these products are actually made, there's very important distinctions. And so this may get at a kind of a deeper level of significance and variation in terms of identity. You know, in the grand scheme of things, it's pretty easy to kind of copy a design or to copy like the idea of something like a bracelet from a distance. But the manufacturing processes is something you have to learn in a much more intimate context. So when these two things kind of deviate, it may tell us two different stories, one about kind of aspirational affiliations and another about the kind of like true affiliations of who was really in the same kind of learning community as other people. So the basic um, story of Trincheras will start in the Altar Valley, which um, goes from very, very, very Northwest Sonora into very, very, very Southwest Arizona. And the basic sequence um, starts out, we see people here living in pit house villages by about 200 AD or so. Um, in the altar phase, right, this tradition of building Cerro de Chincheras, which is um, sites on dark volcanic hills that rely on dry laid masonry to make a kind of terraced effect, right? This really kind of kicks off um, in the altar phase, although there are some earlier examples in the altar phase. And in the altar valley, there appears to be 
a demographic expansion. And this is when we start to get some larger habitational um, serial stage and cherus in the region. But then in the Riolito, they infer that there's actually an incursion of Hoacom groups and that the Hoacom and the Jancheris, at least in this period of time, are relatively antagonistic against each other. And that the end story of this is that most of the Chincheris folks leave this valley and they're actually gonna go to the Magdalena Valley, which is where we're really gonna kind of pick up the story of Chincheris, right? Oh, sorry, I, I forgot I have one or two more slides here about the Altor Valley. So uh, just a couple more words on the site type of Cerro Sage Chincheris. This can be applied to quite a few different sites. They're not necessarily all of the exact same milk. They probably served a number of different functions. Um, there's been a long debate in archaeology about exactly what the kind of functional role of Cerro Sage Chairs were, but they can certainly be multiple things at once, as pointed out um, quite a few times by Randy and Alyssa. But one of the things they emphasize, particularly in the Altar Valley, is they certainly had defensive qualities. And if we think about what hostile interactions were at this time, what warfare looked like, um, the proto historic early colonial period kind of model for warfare in indigenous context is what we would refer to as run through raids, where you kind of run through a village and kind of destroy what you can. And so you can imagine living on a hill with many terraces that more or less kind of turn the site into a maze. It's going to be very effective at kind of defending against these sort of run through raids. And they argue that this is an obvious kind of logic to why some of these sites were constructed in the way that they were. And this kind of fits with their interpretation that there was probably this antagonistic relationship with the Holcom at this time period. Okay. So now moving to the Magdalena Valley. Um, if you've ever heard about the Trincheras region, then chances are you've heard about the site of the Cerro de Trincheras. So again, it's a Cerro de Trincheras site that is named the Cerro de Trincheras in the Trincheras region, which I know is a bit confusing. And this site gets occupied at around 1300. There had certainly been Trincheras people in the Magdalena Valley before this, right? But we see a big population boom. Um, the obvious implication being as some of those folks left the Altar Valley, you probably had a large influx of those people moving in with relatives and kind of known shared cultural identity folks down in the Magdalena Valley. And this is when the Cerro de Chincheras gets constructed. Certainly there had been some Cerro de Chincheras in the region before then. Now, a number of other important changes occur at this time period. The most obvious to archeologists is that they stop making painted ceramics. Um, and then you also start to see changes in some of the other Cerro de Chincheras constructions in the valley that not necessarily at these Cerro de but at these kind of smaller ones, um, around the Magdalena Valley, you start to get a kind of replicated form of ritual architecture on this um, summits, uh, these kind of ring shaped things that we refer to as corrales. So interestingly, um, the Cerro de Chincheras, you know, it's this massively terraced hill that you can see from kilometers away, meaning you can perceive the terraces from kilometers away. It's this very overt statement of a kind of unified identity of everybody living on this hill. Um, Randy and Alyssa estimated it was possible that up to a thousand people lived at this one site at one time, which would be huge by most North American Southwest standards. Um, and so a lot of effort going into like creating these terraces. But then if we look at the domestic architecture, the actual houses that people are living in, they're, they're quite minimalistic. They're, they're pretty basic hall like structures. Um, they're actually quite difficult to, to excavate, as I understand, just because they're often kind of not clear of where they, you know, the boundaries are even at because they're made of mostly perishable materials. And so to me, and I'm deviating a little bit with my own interpretations here, this is a really interesting contrast that you have on the one hand, a kind of a suppression of what we would think of as conspicuous consumption, right? It's very much not the Packy May story where you have this kind of grandiose architecture Right? But nonetheless, you have this massive investment in this communal project of building the Cerro de Chinchera. So there's a real kind of contrast going on here. There's a number of really interesting features that, that kind of contribute to this story as well. And again, kind of going back to the, the standard narrative of uh, Alyssa and Randy here, which is um, one that I'm by and large completely in agreement with, that there is this interesting distinction between two public forms of architecture. One is referred to as La Concha, the other that we'll talk about here in a moment is El Caracol, which is on the summit. So the site has, if I go back here really quick, this kind of natural amphitheater shape to it. And La Concha is located kind of right down here at the base of the amphitheater. So if you go to the site, and again, it's set up as a public monument, so you can go and walk along the interpretive trail. It's a really interesting phenomenon that you'll be able to hear like chickens in the, the little local town that's right in front of the site, along with dogs barking and even the occasional like conversation in the street if the wind is just right because of this natural amphitheater effect, right? But this also means that presumably whatever sorts of activities occurred down here in La Concha, 
were probably witnessable and perhaps even you could hear the actual things that were going on in this context. Um, exactly what occurred here, we're not sure. The name La Concha kind of plays at the idea of maybe it was a ball court. That's not the general interpretation. Perhaps it was a dance platform. It could have been any number of things and of course could have been multiple things at once. But this contrasts a lot with what we find up on, or really I should say near the summit, kind of on the saddle, basically the, the flat spot next to the summit where we have El Caracol, it's kind of a singular feature. Um, they found a number of spindle whorls in this, and um, this led uh, Lisa Villapondo and Randy to suggest maybe it was a kind of focal point of female-centric ritual. Um, but importantly, it's not easy to get here, right? Going back to this idea that building all these terraces turns the site into a bit of a maze, there's really only one effective way to come to the summit. And this appears to be a terrace that was controlled by the folks who more or less would have been the local elites or what constituted elites at Cerro de Chincheras. In other words, this is a very kind of controlled space as opposed to La Concha, which would have been open and visible to everybody, even if you weren't necessarily participating in what was going on there. Um, you know, so going uh, to this area that is right below the summit, this perhaps kind of elite uh, controlled um, terrace, it's important to point out, you know, again, we're not talking about elites in the same sense uh, necessarily of what we see at Pekime, where you see this kind of grandiose conspicuous consumption. But there is a similarity here in that many of the objects that were found here seem to suggest that the source of power in the society was very much based in ritual. But interestingly, you get quite a diversity uh, of artifacts that are associated with basically every form of ritual that we see across uh, the greater North American Southwest. So you had uh, a good number of these shell forms and actually you can kind of see the, the spiral form there of that shell is where this feature gets its name. It's arguably um, a reference to a cross-sectioned Kona shell. And these, we generally assume not only at Trincheras but across North America and Southwest that they were used as tinklers, presumably in, in dance regalia, one possible um, Ethnohistoric reference would be Yoemi deer dancers. They today use um, cocoon rattles of insects, but the same basic effect could be achieved. We also have cloud blower pipes, not this one here. This one's actually from a member's example. I couldn't find a good photo of the ones from the Chincheras, but same basic idea. And these generally are associated with rain making activities across the North American Southwest. And then we have a fair number of actual animal elements, some of them associated potentially with actual deer dance costume elements. I should specify deer dance costume elements that's very much associated with Cahitan people. Um, there's varying interpretations of who the descendants of Chinchereños are. Um, in my own personal interpretation would be likely Autumn, which would not necessarily be Cahitan people, but of course traditions can be shared across ethno-linguistic boundaries. And I'm not necessarily correct in my interpretation that uh, the Autumn are the most or singular descendants uh, of the Chinchereños. And then also there are just lots of large animal bones up here, which could suggest that there was some feasting behavior here. This is something we actually also see at Pakime, although in that case, it tends to be with agave. There's some very huge ovens at uh, Pakime, which presumably supported ritual feasting activities, basically hosting large parties. So again, uh, the kind of wrap this all up um, in a kind of amalgamated set of interpretations there is definitely a monumental investment likely in response to kind of outside pressure in this case, probably related to Ho'okam individuals. It's not necessarily the case that that meant there is no relationship with the Ho'okam. We can think of the ethno-historic period, many different autumn groups at times had a, at least slightly hostile or agnostic interactions with each other. It could have been something like that um, in the pre-colonial era as well. Um, but there's not a lot of what I would refer to as conspicuous consumption. There is a burial context that's been um, investigated, interestingly enough, kind of plays into this whole calm narrative as well, that they practice kind of urn cremation, a, a pattern very familiar to pre-classic Ho'okam, so not contemporary Ho'okam, but the Ho'okam kind of right before this time period. And we see things like a handful of coffer bells and a handful full of polychromes um, that came over the Sierra Madre from Pakime. Not a lot of these. But the fact that they're going into these cremation burials, again, drawing on the ethno-historical literature, 
that suggests that these were probably intentionally being taken out of circulation. So again, kind of conspicuous consumption is not really allowed. It seems to be that there's a lot of kind of leveling mechanisms going on at this site. And again, this is very much kind of my own spin on, on Randy and Alyssa's, um, you know, decades uh, of data gathering, that there seems to be a kind of a suppression of, a, of individualistic identity relative to this kind of massive investment in this kind of monumental architecture, which is a contrast that I find quite fascinating. And I should mention, uh, which was actually hinted at in Al's um, discussion of where you're going to be doing tours at, that Cerro de Chincheras definitely exist outside of the Chincheras region. They're in the Hohokam region. Um, Cerro Prieto is actually where I did my own master's research way back in the early 2000s or so. So uh, what exactly does this signify? It could be a couple of things. Um, these Cerro de Chincheras over here in Chihuahua those are largely much earlier in time, but it doesn't mean that people didn't draw inspiration from them and still afford them some sort of kind of ideological inspiration when they kind of came to the idea of Chincheras over here later in time in the Chincheras and Hohokam region. But certainly this tradition is shared up into the Hohokam region. And we've had the same debates there about are they largely ideological places or ritual places or are they defensive locations? They, of course, um, could be both. Um, I will say immediately around the Magdalena Valley, you obviously get a lot of these chincheras. And as I said, there is a kind of uniform architecture on their summits. And my own advisors, when I was a PhD student, the fishes, they really emphasized the idea that it would have been possible to coordinate valley-wide rituals by having people kind of stand on the summits. And maybe it was understood that you kind of watch these aeration chairs for a certain kind of signal. And then everybody participated in the same ritual at their own local community at this time. Um, to what extent we can call some of these things that go all the way up into the Pueblo region as Cerro de Chincheras, it's a little bit more equivocal, but I will point out that oftentimes these are all on the same sort of dark volcanic hills, even though there are other options in the region. So maybe there is a kind of broadly shared association with these sorts of spaces that's important. Okay, so for the last region we'll talk about and the region I work in, but the one I'll actually spend the least amount of time on, we'll do this here in Madre Occidental. And I have two big themes that I'm going to hit here. Um, we'll talk a little bit about exchanges because it's been historically important, and then we'll mainly talk about demography. All right. So the basic chronology here, um, we don't know much of anything about this early period, right? but around 1000 AD or so, there's a lot of people living in this region. And unlike these other regions, which both ended around 1450, which is a similar story for the Hohokam and the Sinagua as well, um, we see populations maintaining at a very high level well into the historic period here, or at least well into the colonial period, I should say. So this is complicated by not having many early sites, which I think are probably just built in different locations down on floodplains, all right? And then the fact that people tended to build the same sites in the same locations over and over and over again. So even in places like the Hohokam, where you have a lot of demographic continuity, you at least tend to get some bit of village drift so that the sites are kind of spread out temporarily. But in this region, people really quite literally lived on top of each other for 500 to 1,000 years. So that really kind of complicates sorting out uh, much of a chronology. So for many years, we didn't have much archaeological evidence from this region at all. And so people kind of defaulted to using ethno-historical documents, and in particular, these four um, chronicles of early conquistadors were very influential. And there are two main points that were drawn from these. One was the prolific nature of kind of local warfare. Now, the Spanish themselves certainly contributed to this quite a bit, and so it's really hard to disentangle to what extent was kind of spurred by the Spanish and what was kind of legitimate internecine warfare. But it seemed to suggest a lot of shifting and kind of very fluid alliances existed between different groups in this region. And then the other big theme that is important from these documents is that it was interpreted that there was a lot of exchange goods moving around this region. Just to kind of give away the end here, archaeologically, we haven't really been able to verify either of these very well, um, but we can say kind of with some um, definitive conclusions that it really doesn't look like there's a whole lot of exchange items kind of moving through this region, but it was still quite possibly important as kind of a, a pass through region for ideas. So important to emphasize that populations are really constrained in this region to these very narrow river valleys. Um, you can see this kind of dark green stripe here. This is a, an image from of the Bevispe Valley, and it's the rainy season here, so it looks greener overall. But almost all the sites we find are really kind of tied to these rivers. Certainly people utilize the rest of the landscape 
but in terms of long-term sedentary habitation, it was pretty much all riverine. So most of the river valleys in this region run north-south, so you get a lot of segmentation naturally between populations on an east-west transect just because you kind of have to go over these major mountain ranges. But even along the courses of these rivers, you get these steep canyon sections. So you can see here, for example, on the Moctezuma Valley where I did my dissertation research, there are these gaps where you get no sites, basically where you enter these steep canyons. And so you also have populations that are segmented, not in quite as drastic a fashion, but also segmented on this kind of north-south transects. You can see a couple of more of these in this example of the Sararipa Valley over here, where you have essentially these no-man lands. So in the grand scheme of things, this made it very hard to develop large-scale polities. People were kind of forced just by the topography to have fairly localized affairs. Um, to draw a couple of points uh, of commonality with the larger North American Southwest, I'll mention I'm going to use this color coding system because I'm going to hop around different valleys pretty quickly. So where the dots are, those colors will tell you what images I'm referring to here. So purple, Moctezuma, blue, Rio Sonora. So interestingly, we have pit houses going into the very late period. In most of the North American Southwest pit houses um, end by about 1,000 or 1,100 or so. Uh, except for ritual context, where I imagine most folks are familiar with the concept of a kiva. Particularly, this is an ancestral Puebloan and Mogollon tradition where ritual rooms are still underground. Interestingly, we see pit houses going in well into the 1400s here in the Rio Sonora region and at least a couple of places. But some of these also look like very specialized structures. This one down here, which was in the Sonora Valley, we got a lot of um, spindle whorls out of it and in this one here in the Moctezuma Valley. This one apparently had a raised floor. It had this very extended entryway. It had these curious other architectural embellishments that we don't really know how to interpret, but it appears to also be a very kind of specialized context that may in fact have some similarities and connections with the concept of the Kiva that we see in the North American Southwest further north. Mm -hmm. um, most of the architecture is extremely variable. This makes it hard to uh, interpret patterns. Um, the most common form are these mostly perishable structures with just these river cobble cimientos is what we refer to them, but basically just rock outlines that then have perishable structures attached to them. But you also have a lot of coarse adobe, and even very rarely you have um, some stone masonry that looks like it would be at home up there on the Colorado Plateau, and people will mix and match. So here we have stone cimientos with adobe. In terms of larger patterns, Almost all the sites are tied to these mesa contexts that are right alongside the river valleys. And so people living on these places for, as I said, many generations at a time, living on top of each other. Um, but it's not really a pattern that's super relatable to any place in the North American Southwest because it's kind of in between what we would think of as the two ends of the continuum there, where you have a kind of rancheria and Hoacom, where you have a very kind of dispersed settlement pattern. And then the Puebloan region where you obviously have these kind of multiple room blocks. Here we tend to get small little room blocks and then a whole lot of individual little rooms. So it's really kind of something in between a rancheria and a Pueblo region. So again, kind of emphasizing that idea that you get this kind of diversity here that you don't necessarily see in the North, uh, uh, US Southwest at the same level. At larger scales, site layouts, we haven't excavated near as much as we have in the U.S. Southwest, so and no sites have been excavated in their entirety. We don't do contract archaeology in this region in the same sort of way where we bring out heavy machinery. So a lot of this is just based on surface evidence, but we seem to see things like plazas that appear just based on surface evidence at a couple of sites. And then over here in the Rio Sonora Valley, there are a couple of things that were interpreted as ball courts. Certainly, they were very large enclosures of some sort that don't seem to have domestic architecture interior to the walls, but there is a lot of domestic architecture exterior to the walls, and a couple of these appear to be associated with little platform mounds. So potentially ball courts. Um, you also get small platform mounds. I found one of these in the Moctezuma Valley. They're reported from the Bebispe Valley. Um, and there's also some Cerro de Chinchera. So they, they look a little different. We have a square outline, summit feature as opposed to a circular one, but again, could be defensive, could be entirely ritualistic. Um, I already mentioned the longevity of sites, right? So this is again, something that's a bit of a contrast with much of the North American Southwest. A lot of Puebloan communities, they tended to be occupied only a couple generations, kind of 40 years is a, a modal time period for many Puebloan sites. 
whole com sites, they often last much longer, but you tend to get this kind of internal drift and you get this big rupture at the kind of classic pre-classic border. Whereas here, things just seem to chug along. And many of the sites that were occupied in 1000 AD are in fact still occupied uh, today if they were large sites. So here's just a couple of examples where we have Adobe architecture over a pit house. Here we have a nice Adobe wall that was then completely covered with this huge midden. Um, we actually had some dates from this particular location that go before 1000 AD, I think all the way back to 800 AD, but then it also clearly had a, a proto-colonial occupation going into the 1500s. So i uh, gonna try and wrap this up relatively quickly here, but just another thing to point out, um, the ceramics, archeologists kind of go-to material culture we get an incredible diversity and a lot of it shows links to the North American Southwest in, in different regions. So, you know, here's admittedly a single shirt, looks very whole esque but made in a local tradition all the way down here in Sauripa. Um, you go even further south to the Wadabampo region, you get two and fourfold symmetry that looks like it could have inspired a lot of different Mogollon wares. Um, this is probably actually a Chincheras vessel, although it was found in the Rio Sonora. And again, it shows a lot of superficial similarities, at least in kind of layout design with the Hoakam region. Um, these are glaze wares. They're actually Casas Grandis polychromes, but they come from a post pakime context. And it certainly appears that maybe folks got better and better at glaze, at least here in Sonora, which may suggest some kind of connections with where you had strong glazeware traditions up in the Puebloan region uh, of the Rio Grande. And then just lastly, as an example of the kind of range of variation. These are all from the Sauripa Valley and you can see there's more or less continuous graduation from red on brown all the way to black on white. Generally, we think of these things as not being things that overlap in um, the Northern North American Southwest, right? I can skip this one. So to wrap it up here for the exchange, in the grand scheme of things, we haven't actually found much that really kind of supports this idea of long distance exchange. There was one macaw reported way back in the 1980s from, from Terrace, we recently, I don't have it on this one yet, found a parrot over in Sauripa, but only tiny fractions of polychromes, essentially nothing from West Mexico and only a few things um, from Casas Grandes. You do get Casas Grandes polychromes well over here into the Sierra Madre, but once you get down into the valleys, we're talking one, two percent, and oftentimes less than that, and only a few copper bells in a couple of regions. There are a couple of places that stand out. Rincon de Bampo down here would be one, but by and large, these are kind of isolated islands of interaction in a sea of more or less local interaction. Looking at things like obsidian, which are more local, these really reflect that idea of kind of shifting alliances. You find very non-intuitive patterns of groups that are right next to each other, don't exchange obsidian at all, but then you'll see groups that are actually quite distant from each other that exchange a lot of obsidian. So this again seems to kind of play into that idea that maybe you have some kind of competitive alliances that don't necessarily always lead to friendships between the closest neighboring regions. And then just the last point I want to make here is that we see a kind of continuous occupation. This is a, a technique that archaeologists use where they basically just take all the radiocarbon dates and they add them all up together. Some of these individual valleys, we don't have enough dates to really make this useful, but I really want to draw attention to these two down here at the bottom where I have kind of all of the radiocarbon dates for the Wadabampa region down here that we're not really going to talk about. And then all of the Sierra Madre region that I've been talking about here. And you can see we have this big spike and then more or less a plateau. You can ignore those peaks as kind of a side effect uh, of the calibration curve. And it goes strongly until after 1500. And at this point, it's not that the people disappear, it's that people stop using radiocarbon to date those contexts because you have things like Mahalikas and, and historic period stuff that can tell you a date much better than radiocarbon. So more or less continuous occupation span, which is very different from all surrounding regions. And we see this in the material culture as well. Um, here is a site that produced some colonial copper and iron, but it also had member ceramics. It had Casas Grandes ceramics. It had rare Sonoran polychromes. And we can look at a couple of different contexts where we see colonial period structures. These are mission sites were built basically just immediately across a small little drainage from where we had large pre-colonial populations. And both of these examples are from the Fronteras Valley, pretty near the international border. But in both of these sites here, we had a large number, or I shouldn't say a large number, large for the region number of Costas Grandis polychromes, right? So these are clearly places that we're still consuming, holding on the Costas Grandis polychromes at the moment that we had colonial folks show up. And then they more or less tried to track these people to cross the wash 
and live as neophytes in the new mission context. And interestingly enough, the kind of native section of these new kind of mission context were on the edges of the mesa that were the closest to their old habitations just across the wash, right? So again, a, a very much a clear story of continuity that contrasts with almost all of the surrounding region. And this is really important if we think about the demographic story that people tell in the, in the Southwest. Um, admittedly, this uh, figure is a couple years old, and so I don't want to throw these people under the bus. These are very good work they did. They took a lot of data to come up with these interpretations, but it's presented as folks more or less kind of disappearing at around 1450 to 1500. But that's not really a complete story if you're leaving out the one place in the North American Southwest where, in fact, we know there was a whole lot of people living at 1450 and on to 1500 and honestly on all the way to 1700. So there's definitely a story to be told here for maybe where some of those people went, if not in large numbers, at least in terms of kind of just where the successful stories of the Southwest were playing out at, at that period in time. Okay. So I won't read this to you. I went a bit over what I wanted to, but I will uh, now open it up for any and all questions. Well, thanks, Matt. Whoops, get my video. Thank you, Matt, that was great. It was a, a very nice sweeping overview of all of Northern Chihuahua and Sonora. A lot of uh, information, a lot to digest there. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, okay. I'm looking for questions. I think you just covered everything so well there aren't any questions. <laughs> yeah, that's almost <laughs> never the actual truth, but I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Bill, can you see the Q&A? Uh, let me get it up here. I may need to make you co-host. Oh, well, well, Paul Minnis wants me to know his talk will not be until February 2025, so apparently I should have uh, uh, talked about his ideas more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Q and A. Oh, here's one. Paul Menes, right off. What about Durango, the southern one? Well, I mean, come on, Paul. There's, you know, <laughs> I had an hour. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, no, I mean, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. Durango. There are a, a number of. Uh, you know, very clear connections, particularly in iconography of the Chow Chuichis region. It shows up both in rock art. Um, Aaron Wright has a, a good publication out on that recently that compares Hoakam and, and Chow Chuichis rock art. And of course, there's some very classic um, treatments of particularly life forms that show up on Hoakam ceramics that also show up in Chow Chuichis. Um, So very clearly some connections there. And, you know, I started out by mentioning that there are these clear kind of linguistic patterns of Tepeman speakers, and that's another thing that's typically invoked, right? That there were Tepeman speakers down in Durango, and then presumably the Hoakam being the ancestors of the Otham were also Tepeman speakers, that perhaps there was a, a linguistic core there um, between those two places. I tend to think of it more as a linguistic archipelago because there's also Cohetan people that are spread along that same distance. So there are actually kind of like two potential competing corridors, more or less, the to get you to and from Durango. Okay, here's one from John who asked, are the Wichal ancestors? Um, so Wichal would be a, a bit more south. Um, the Wichal actually get invoked a lot in uh, Michael Matthewitz's uh, models of how different ritual ideas are, are moving around the kind of greater southwest. So they are certainly um, Udo Aztecan in the larger sense. Uh, I believe their closest linguistic relatives are the Kora, which are also very at the far southern end of what we're discussing right in this moment. Um, but they're more distantly related uh, to the other groups that I just mentioned, the Tepeman um, and the Cahitan, and that would also include the, the Rawra Muria or the Tarha Mara as well, but certainly relevant players in the larger narrative of things. Okay, so Andrew notes that so populations didn't decline in the Sierra Madre Occidental after 1450. Is there any evidence of immigration to that area after 1450 from other parts of the Southwest, Northwest, Akime yeah. or otherwise? Yeah, it's a great question. So we don't see an increase in people. Um, arguably, 
maybe we just kind of haven't looked for it in the right way. I and mean, the overall number uh, of dates we have for Northern Mexico is pretty minimalistic in the grand scheme of things. Um, I was kind of going fast there at the end, but particularly that Fronteras region where you see some of those glazeware ceramics showing up, you also get what is very obviously kind of a Puebloan-esque um, architectural vibe going on there. And we get what I think are, I'm not good at Pueblo ceramics, um, there's at least one Zuni shirt there, um, and there's a couple of other glazeware ceramics that don't look like anything else I've seen um, in northern Mexico. And so I think that they're probably, you know, real grand folks. Whether this signifies that you actually have real grand Pueblo people or Pueblo folks of some other ilk kind of coming into that region, or if this is just reflecting the exchange relationships between the major population centers at that time, um, I think it's an open question. And I would, I would love for somebody else to go and look at some of those sites before they get bulldozed. Be good. So Marilyn says she thought she saw a reference to the book, Wandering Peoples. What is covered in that book? Oh yeah. So, you know, again, I was kind of picking up the pace at that point. So what I really meant to contrast there is um, that's a book by Cynthia Redding about the early colonial period. And one of the points that she makes, it was, it was very common in the Sierra Madre that whenever groups essentially got um, exasperated by the colonial programs that were going on at that time, they had the ability to essentially just disappear into the Sierra Madre Occidental. And so this kind of gave the impression that folks had a very kind of fluid and almost kind of only semi-sedentary existence. But this contrasts a lot with what we see in the archaeological record, where it suddenly looks like people are staying in one place, you know, for 500, six, you know, up to a, a thousand years at a time. Now, this could just be a, uh, an issue of scale. You know, Cynthia Riding was talking about individuals and, and families. You know, that's generally not the level we work at in archaeology when we're looking at, you know, entire villages. So it's certainly possible that people had the ability to kind of pretty freely and porously move between locations, but locations seem to be persistently occupied. So again, there's kind of this open question of how do we reconcile this kind of very early historic record with what our kind of go-to interpretation would be as archaeologists of kind of continuity in one place. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, we got to talk about these. I got one of my own here. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Steve LeBlanc gave a talk in at the U of A and presenting a lot of uh, his current thinking about things. But the main gist of it was he thinks Pakimay became began a whole lot earlier, like mm -hmm. about 1150 or so, and founded by a Chaco elite. Didn't bother to go to Aztec first. Came straight to to Pacume, Picked up folks and members on the way. Maybe. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the uh, idea of Pacume getting started at 1150? Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely going a, a bit uh, out of my comfort zone here a bit. So, I mean, I will point out. Yeah, I mean, going all the way back to the Peso, we know there's a behave. Excuse me, a viejo settlement underneath Pacume, right? So the question of were there people in the Casas Grandes Valley and even at this place of, of Pacume earlier than, you know, pick your date, that's not really in question, right? The The debate is when did Paki May really become Paki May? Um, and, you know, by and large, you know, I know Steve's got, you know, a couple of things, you know, he's reinterpreting some of the tree ring dates and, you know, he's arguing kind of based on trying to, to reformulate some of the pesos uh, existing data. And he's certainly not crazy by any stretch of the imagination. I, I think there's, a debate to be had there, but by and large, I'm going to default to, you know, Wayland and Mendes' interpretation, which is based on a lot more recent data, and it's really focused on kind of dating specifically when does Ramos polychrome start and when does particular architectural tradition start. And outside of Pacume, those things don't really start until about 1300 AD, right? So maybe it's possible those things actually started earlier at Pacume, and we just don't have the dates to kind of demonstrate it. Right? But if we take the evidence from immediately around Pakime as being representative of, of Pakime itself, I, I think 1300 is a much safer bet for when the medio period pattern starts. Um, but, you know, again, I, I wouldn't slam the door on Steve LeBlanc's interpretations by any stretch of imagination. And the truth of the matter is somebody at some point is going to have to go back to Pakime, um, do some excavation there and do things with modern dating techniques to answer the question.
Well, ans well answered. Yeah. We got another one from Brian here, and I'm not uh, exactly clear, but he says, you know, right off, four minutes right off, what about Durango? And then you define the Southwest isn't the whole calm, the only major irrigation-based society, and these others are riverine. Yeah, so that's a great question. So, I mean, a lot of this has to do with um, how we've looked, right? So I would certainly say the Hoacom had the biggest irrigation networks of anybody in, in the North American Southwest writ large, including Northwest Mexico. Um, but Packy May certainly had an elaborate um, irrigation system. Um, let me hold on here. If I can get out of this. I actually cut a slide or two out of this for <laughs> length, but I can go back to it here. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay. Um, so Packy May definitely had an elaborate uh, irrigation system. It probably was not at the scale of Holocom by any stretch of the imagination. There was a lot of kind of ritual architecture that was kind of constructed around water. Um, Packy May was really a kind of water city. They had reservoirs. They actually had a, a drainage system. Um, a lot of people, uh, particularly Jeremy Cunningham, really put emphasis on the fact that water actually kind of flowed from the spring through Pakime and then out to the fields that were really immediately adjacent to Pakime and that water probably kind of took on a ritual significance through its passage through Pakime as it went out there. And so water was definitely kind of controlled at a high level. Um, but the trick to really answering this question and the reason why we can't really answer this in a, in a relative sense with a denominator of saying, well, Hokan was this big and Pakime was this big um, is because we don't excavate with um, heavy machinery in, in Northwest Mexico that's generally not allowed. Alyssa Villapondo somehow got permission to do a very small scale project where she did a little bit of that in the Trinjeras region and found canals. Um, but generally, if you're not digging with a backhoe, you're not going to find many canals and you're certainly not going to excavate many canals. So we really just don't have much of an idea of what the scale was at Pakime. Um, it's a pretty good bet. There's also a lot of irrigation over in the Trincheras region as well just based on the morphology of the rivers. But again, you know, we've only found a couple of canals where people have dug a very limited number of trenches. Great. Great. I, I should add one more thing. The Rio Sonora region, um, there was also irrigation none there, but the floodplains are very small. So those were intensively irrigated. Also floodwater recession, which is a kind of other model for getting water on the crops, but they would have been much more constrained spatially. So definitely not of the scale of anything the Hocom had. Okay. See one more question for Marilyn. When is the trip to Casas Grandes being planned for? <laughs> that is not an old Pueblo archaeology center thing, but that's uh, the Arizona Archaeological and Historical Society is planning a trip that's led by Dr. Menes yeah, about two weeks from now in early April. Sorry, Al. That, that, that's okay. Uh, Marilyn, if you want to email me, I can give you contact information for that. We're we're good friends with Ark and His, so that's fine. Okay, there's um, still uh, still room for, for a few more people there. Well, I have a question, uh, Matt. Uh, I noticed you've used the term exchange several times, and I didn't hear you use the word trade. And a lot of previous archaeologists, DePeso among them, explicitly explicitly used the term trade. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, so I mean, that goes into a kind of broader anthropological theoretical debate, right? Exchange is kind of this broader realm of interaction and trade is a kind of more specific realm of interaction that usually refers to the exchange of material goods, um, at least uh, as I generally understand it. Um, I think you can make, at least in terms of the Sierra Madre, where I was really um, making uh, that discussion, a stronger argument for exchange than you can for trade. Um, to really answer your question, I was just being sloppy. It, it is is the truth of the matter here. Um, we don't see a lot of evidence for trade, um, but I think we could make a very interesting argument about exchange. So anybody who's played the childhood game of telephone knows that when you kind of pass information through a lot of people, it, it tends to get adulterated and change a lot, right? And so, you know, this kind of uh, thesis and polygon model here is what I imagine is the kind of political landscape, right? With each one of these little polygons being its own little independent polity. Um, the ones that are outlined here are the ones we have data for. This is not all uh, mine and John and Lupita's data. Uh, Cristina Garcia Moreno, Jupiter Martinez, uh, um, Cesar Quijada, um, uh, John Douglas, a number of other people have really contributed to this. But the point is they all looked very distinct, right? 
And so if you imagine not trying to pass physical objects through this network, but trying to pass information, you're going to have to go through a lot of different kind of local communities. And on one hand, that means it's probably going to get altered a lot, but it's also more or less going to guarantee that there's some path that's going to work for getting this information up to the North American Southwest, right? So if we look at some of the work like Patricia Gilman of, you know, how the Hero Twins narrative shows up on members' pots that obviously came from somewhere down in Mesoamerica, um, but it's probably got its own unique spin on it. Or if we look at even things like Quetzalcoatl um, imagery on Salado polychromes, right? Where the context that it appears to be used in is very, very different from the context that it kind of originated from in Mesoamerica. This could actually be a very conducive model for kind of facilitating not only the transmission of information, its exchange, but also its alteration along the way to kind of meet local context just by benefit of the number of ears it has to go through. Hey, I'm not seeing any more questions, so I think we can wrap it up here. So on behalf of Old Pueblo Archaeology Center, I'd like to thank our guest speaker, Matt, for sharing with us this evening. I also thank all of you in the audience for joining us tonight. And I'd like to encourage you to please consider making a donation to help pay Old Pueblo's Zoom subscription and program expenses and to support Old Pueblo's education programs. And with that, say good night. Thank you, Matt. Thank y'all. Thanks for the invite. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Have a good night. <laughs>